Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast by the Houston Law Review, where we highlight legal issues with prominent lawyers and discuss the study and practice of law. I'm your host, Kevin Donovan. This month's episode of Emphasis Added is a special episode where we bring to you a condensed version of the Houston Law Review's 26th annual Frankel Lecture on academic freedom and discrimination in a polarizing time. The lecture features keynote speaker Jeannie Gerson and commentators Kiara Bridges and Keith Whittington. You'll hear first from the lecture's moderator, University of Houston law professor Dave Fagundes, who will introduce the speakers and lecture topic before handing things over to the speakers. I hope you enjoy this episode, and as always, be sure to like and subscribe. So for over a quarter century, uh, this event has brought together some of the nation's leading legal academics into conversation with one another and with UHLC faculty, students, and of course, the local bar. Um, and indeed, in the virtual context, which we are in for our second year running, the reach of this lecture can be national and even global. We're actually at 144 participants uh, at this moment and growing as I speak. Now, the lecture would not exist without the generous participation of the Frankel family. Uh, they have supported this uh, event generously since its inception, hence the name. So I want to pause here to give them sincere thanks on behalf of the University of Houston Law Center faculty, as well as the Houston Law Review. Now, it is a, a real privilege for me to welcome as our keynote speaker today, Professor Jeannie Gerson. Professor Gerson is the John H. Watson Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, where she specializes in constitutional, criminal, and family law among other fields. I'm actually fortunate to have known Professor Gerson uh, since we were in law school together uh, some time ago. And um, you can see in, in the, the materials about the Frankel Lecture, all of the litany of Professor Gerson's accomplishments. I'm not going to enumerate them here because if I did, that would probably mean that I would eat up all the time we have for the Frankel Lecture. So instead, I just want to make one observation. I think uh, of all the many qualities that I admire about Professor Gerson's work, which ranges from the articles that she publishes in some of the nation's leading law reviews to her popular writings like her well-received uh, New Yorker columns. They're all characterized by a really a sparkling originality of thought. So the positions Professor Gerson takes in her writing always challenge the standard, you know, tired, predictable battle lines that usually arise in academic and public debates. And her eloquent defenses of those unorthodox positions always result in me and all of her readers learning uh, so much. And, and um, that's certainly true of the piece she's about to present today, which I was fortunate to read a draft of earlier this morning. That's Professor Gerson, but we are also extremely fortunate to have with us today two distinguished commentators to provide two additional insights on the lecture, Professors Kiara Bridges and Keith Whittington. Professor Bridges is a professor of law at the UC Berkeley School of Law, where she teaches family law, and criminal law, among other topics. She is one of the nation's leading voices on these subjects, and in particular has made important contributions on racial and reproductive justice. Her most recent monograph is Critical Race Theory, A Primer, which seeks to provide uh, an accessible and accurate exposition of this school of thought, which is a particularly salient and necessary project today. Professor Whittington is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. He has published widely and voluminously on American political and constitutional history theory. His most recent monograph is Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech, and he is also the chair of the Academic Committee of the Academic Freedom Alliance, of which Professor Gerson is a member of the Legal Advisory Council. So Professor Gerson's lecture is entitled Academic Freedom and Discrimination in a Polarizing Time. Uh, it's especially relevant today and, and even here in Houston. This very morning, I went to, to get the mail from last night and I noticed there was a flyer for a Houston Independent School District election, the kind of election you normally don't pay much attention to, but it's become hugely popular. And I realized it's because the incumbent was challenged by uh, an upstart whose only position was opposing, as she puts it in her election material, CRT, and that election is going to a runoff. Um, so it's a very salient issue across the country and certainly here in Houston. As for Professor Gerson's lecture, she explores how academic freedom has come under threat 
as schools and especially universities are increasingly regarded as a site where politicized cultural conflicts are contested. But rather than point the finger at one side or the other, Professor Gerson illustrates how both the right and the left seek to both invoke and restrict academic freedom when it suits their ideological agendas. Professor Gerson uses this insight to resituate academic freedom, not only as an individual right of a professor to write or teach um, however she chooses, but as an institutional value that furthers the greater goal of intellectual inquiry and the production of knowledge. As such, her project is one that is not only of intellectual interest to lawyers and professors in the field, but that affects all of us, those of us who participate in post-secondary education as faculty or, or uh, students, or those who did participate in it as former students, or as my example illustrates, even people who are involved in contemporary debates, which have trickled all the way down to um, K through 12 education as well. So bottom line, we are in for a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. And so without further ado, I will turn things over to Professor Gerson. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I want to um, start by mentioning an event that happened in 1856 in the lead up to the Civil War. A chemistry professor was dismissed from the faculty at the University of North Carolina for his anti-slavery views. Professor Benjamin Hedrick had expressed support for the Republican presidential candidate who opposed slavery. And that led to public calls for so-called black Republicans to be driven out of schools. After he responded in a newspaper article explaining himself, the university found him unfit and the trustees removed him. Students burned him in effigy. This teacher's dismissal for his views on the central moral and political conflict dividing the country would of course not be the last. At the time, there was no established concept of academic freedom in the United States. Academic freedom as an institutional phenomenon and a legal idea in this country began to develop in the 20th century. From that time until today, academic freedom debates have been mired in the deepest conflicts that have marked each era. So in 2021, we are in an academic freedom crisis. For this, the right-wing observers would blame the left and the left-wing observers would blame the right or might claim that the crisis is a made up thing to bash liberals for political gain. And worse, we have seen political attempts to champion academic freedom by attempting to restrict that freedom, thereby decreasing the credibility of defenses of academic freedom. In my 15 years of law teaching, an atmosphere of fear about speaking freely has never been more palpable. I see it in my students and I see it in my colleagues. And it is at this moment that sober discussions about academic freedom are most needed. So I'm very grateful to the Houston Law Review and the University of Houston Law School for inviting me to devote this Frankel lecture to this subject and for inviting my treasured colleagues, Kiara Bridges and Keith Whittington to share their own comments on the subject. And also, of course, for asking my friend David Fagandas to moderate this discussion. The development of academic freedom in the United States dates to 1900, when Stanford University forced out an economics and sociology professor, Edward Allsworth Ross. Ross had made public statements that provoked the university's sole trustee, Jane Stanford, to write to its president that Professor Ross cannot be trusted and he should go. He is a dangerous man. In the context of his public support for organized labor leaders who blamed Asian immigration for lower wages, Professor Ross had stated that the Orient is a land of cheap men. America will be imperiled if Orientals are allowed to pour into this country in great numbers. And should the worst come to worse, it would be better for us to turn our guns upon every vessel bringing Japanese to our shores then permit them to land. Ross's pro-labor and anti-immigration statements, along with his calling for municipal ownership of railroads, arguably attacked the legacy of the Stanford family business practices. Later, Ross would also become a proponent of eugenics. 
The university president was loath to fire Ross, and he entreated Mrs. Sanford to consider the injury to the university's reputation if the word will go out that he was dismissed for political reasons. He said, we cannot bring good men here if they believe their positions insecure. But Mrs. Stanford was adamant that a professor who associates himself with the discriminatory rhetoric of political demagogues and plays into the hands of the lowest and vilest elements of socialism had to go. So Professor Ross was dismissed. And that soon fueled protest resignations from several other professors who objected to the firing and brought national attention to the issue of academic freedom. In 1915, the philosopher Arthur Lovejoy, who had resigned from Stanford in protest of Ross's firing, joined John Dewey to establish the American Association of University Professors. The purpose of that new organization was to protect academic freedom and tenure for faculty. The organization's declaration stated that a teacher's academic freedom comprises freedom of inquiry and research, freedom of teaching within the university or college, and freedom of extramural utterance and action. This declaration asserted that faculty are not in any proper sense the employees of university trustees. Distancing an employee's an employer's simple ability to dismiss an employee was central to how academic freedom would primarily be enforced through job security and insulation from firing. So stepping back, we should note that the canonical event that inspired the development of academic freedom involved firing a professor who made bigoted statements about Asians and that the academic freedom solution was to make it hard to fire such a professor. Universities then gradually developed the system of tenure. After World War II, an influx of veterans attend attending college on the GI Bill caused universities to need more teachers, and they used the prospect of tenure to recruit faculty. Soon in the late 1940s and early 1950s, we were in the period of fear of the spread of communism, known as the Red Scare and the McCarthy era. In his Senate investigations and hearings, Senator Joe McCarthy accused many academics of supporting the Communist Party and being disloyal to the United States. The existence of tenure by this point shielded at least some of those academics from being fired for their views or for their refusal to cooperate with McCarthy. The chilling impact of the McCarthy era on academia first provoked the Supreme Court to make sweeping statements supporting academic freedom. In a, 1915, in a 1957 case involving a professor who was convicted of contempt for refusing to answer questions by the state legislature on his beliefs on communism. The Supreme Court held that the, courts, that the professor's conviction infringed his liberty under the Due Process Clause. Chief Justice Warren emphasized the vital role in a democracy that is played by those who guide and train our youth. He claimed that if you impose any straitjacket upon the intellectual leaders in our colleges and university, that would imperil the future of our nation. Without the freedom to inquire, to study, and to evaluate, to gain new maturity and understanding, our civilization, our civilization will stagnate and die. So in a concurrence, Justice Felix Frankfurter, a former professor at Harvard Law School, also wrote of the dependence of a free society on free universities. The Supreme Court's next significant defense of academic freedom came in 1967 in a case about New York statutes and regulations that were used to prevent appointment and retention of subversive people. Several university teachers were dismissed and threatened with dismissal for refusing to say whether they had ever advised or taught the violent or unlawful overthrow of the government. The court held that these laws were unconstitutionally vague in violation of due process. The vagueness would make teachers stay as far as possible from utterances or acts which might jeopardize his living. The court stated, our nation is deeply committed to safeguarding academic freedom, which is of transcendent value to us all and not merely to the teachers concerned. That freedom is therefore a special concern of the First Amendment, which does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. Mm 
the country would soon enter the era of political protests about civil rights and the Vietnam War in the late 1960s. And the Supreme Court had a chance to address academic freedom in that context, in a case about students who sought to form a local chapter of Students for a Democratic Society, known as SDS. And they were denied recognition by their college. The court reiterated the commitment to academic freedom and held that a college's denial of official recognition to a college organization, just because it finds the views expressed by the group to be abhorrent, violated the First Amendment right of individuals to associate to further their personal beliefs. Now, I also consider the Supreme Court's affirmative action case, Regents of the University of California versus Baki from 1978, to be an important academic freedom decision. The court held that creating a diverse classroom environment was a compelling state interest, such that the use of race conscious affirmative action was not discrimination for purpose of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. There, the, the Supreme Court con connected the dots between a university's atmosphere of speculation, experiment, and creation with the ability of universities to enroll a diverse class of students so as to expose them to the ideas and mores of students as diverse as this nation of many peoples. Without diversity, the court said, the robust exchange of ideas would not be possible. The support of academic freedom from the McCarthy era through the civil rights and anti-war movements arose in the face of overtly political attempts by government to constrain what academic, academics and students should say and think. Since that time, the doctrine of academic freedom has mostly been forged in the application of the First Amendment to teachers and students at public institutions. So just earlier this year, the Sixth Circuit decided the case of Meriwether versus Hartop which involved a professor who was disciplined under a public university's Title IX anti-discrimination policy when he refused to address a transgender student who identified as female as Ms. or to use female pronouns when calling on her in class because the professor perceived the student as male and did not believe that a person's gender could be different from their sex assigned at birth. In the professor's lawsuit against the university, the Sixth Circuit held that the professor plausibly alleged that his refusal to use Ms. and female pronouns to address the student was protected by the First Amendment. Now, it is clear to me that the First Amendment protects the professor's expression of views on matters of public concern, such as gender identity. But I find the decision in Meriwether erroneous because the right that the professor asserted is just not the same as the right to express a view on a matter of public concern. I find the professor's complaint no more compelling as a free speech matter than someone insisting on, say, addressing me by my Korean first name instead of my American first name or my maiden name instead of my married name. For sure, the choice might reflect politics or it might reflect views about gender or marriage or immigration or assimilation or ethnicity. But that does not render it speech on a matter of public concern, as the doctrine requires. It is about the use of another's basic form of address, and it is not a free speech right to impose that on another person, whether or not you believe it constitutes discrimination to refuse. But at a higher level, the case also reveals what makes the subject of academic freedom most difficult today. The problem of defining what academic freedom is in relation to claims of discrimination. In Meriwether, it was hard not to get caught in the frame of either or. Either it was discrimination against the transgender student, or it was academic freedom on the part of the professor, when really it may have been neither. Political fights that play out as debates about academic freedom have strongly reemerged following the dramatic cultural shifts of the past two decades. In the past five years, global social movements, including Me Too and Black Lives Matter, protesting the pervasive harms of discrimination have affected the contours of academic freedom. Political polarizations that have been, that have been intensifying 
before and throughout the Trump years have squarely and explicitly become public fights about academic freedom, about what teachers should teach, what students should learn, and what speech should end up with a teacher or a student being disciplined, fired, or expelled. Let's go back to 2017 when Me Too went, first went viral and global with public revelations of sexual harassment and discrimination in every conceivable workplace. Then in 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement went global after the murder of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin. We have seen the criminal convictions of Chauvin and of Harvey Weinstein, but the broader social impact of these global movements has been seen in a social expectation that there will be negative job consequences for a person's discriminatory wrongdoing, particularly when they are called out by the public. Thus, we've become acculturated in the past several years to the idea that individuals who discriminate, harass, or express views that are racially or sexually offensive should lose their jobs. So where does that leave academic freedom, which, as we know, staked its power from the beginning on making it difficult to discipline or fire academics for offensive statements? In recent years, universities have developed a growing commitment to anti-discrimination principles and practices, including in relation to laws such as Title IX on sex discrimination and Title VI on race discrimination. And university policies on discrimination and harassment, of course, prohibit verbal conduct that may occur in the classroom or in the course of performing duties as a teacher or researcher. You may believe, as I do, that academic freedom must be vigorously protected, but also there has to be a limit to a person's academic freedom where the person's behavior constitutes discrimination or harassment that seriously compromises the environment for learning and teaching. Academic freedom cannot simply mean the right to freely discriminate. And addressing discrimination also cannot mean firing academics for expressing views that may offend others. But it is much more complicated than it seems to appropriately distinguish instances of discrimination or harassment from the exercise of academic freedom. And it has become much harder in the recent past because of our changing ideas of what discrimination is as well as increasing political polarization that makes it so much more difficult for people to give each other the benefit of the doubt. A couple of things that we know, but might be easy to forget. Not everything a professor says is covered by academic freedom. And not everything that hurts or offends someone is discrimination or harassment. Perhaps we can start with a really easy example. So if a professor were to say, in class about a student um, say something like Jane is a slut or were to call a student a racial slur. That is not academic freedom. It is not academic freedom for a variety of reasons, including that it targets an individual on the basis of race or sex. But statements about, say, female promiscuity in society or about the extent of racism in the nation could be covered by academic freedom, even if they may be offensive or hurtful to students or colleagues. And in between are myriad examples of possible statements that may be made about these topics that some people will find offensive and experience as discriminatory, or even creating a hostile environment for them that impairs their learning. And of course, I have to wonder whether today, Professor Ross's statements about turning our guns on Japanese people rather than permitting them to land would receive a full-throated academic freedom defense even from people as committed to academic freedom as I am, or as Keith Whittington is, precisely because of how such a statement would reasonably affect the academic learning environment. And that is the highly contested space in which debates about academic freedom take place today. The contest is not only about what is or is not protected speech or conduct, but also who gets to decide that question, in what way and in what venue. In recent years, definitions of what discrimination and harassment are and what will be investigated or disciplined as such have undoubtedly expanded to cover more than before. 
what many people perceive as creating a hostile environment in 2021 is different from what they would have understood as such only a few years earlier, in part because of the social movements that have raised consciousness about discriminatory harms. We've seen the significant growth of university bureaucracies, including those dedicated to promoting and enforcing university anti-discrimination policies through training, investigation, adjudication, and discipline for reported and alleged incidents. Offices of diversity and inclusion related to this work have grown and become fixtures of university administrations in recent years. Since the work of those offices necessarily disfavors conduct and speech that is discriminatory, their orientation cannot reasonably be expected to be content neutral. And realistically, what, what people experience and report and expect to be disciplined as discrimination or harassment based on their training and their socialization will affect what speech they consider illegitimate. And the more speech that is perceived as illegitimate, the more contests there are over the space wherein people may express views without fearing discipline. So it's not surprising to see what we are seeing right now, that training and discipline efforts on discrimination, harassment, and bullying that are overseen by diversity and inclusion offices are coming into conflict with academic freedom principles. And it is in that vein that for some people, the concept of academic freedom itself is simply associated with defending racist or sexist speech that harms vulnerable people. There are myriad examples of professors and students being threatened with investigation or discipline for speech that some have considered discriminatory and others have considered merely provocative, controversial, or ill-phrased. And that has fueled the widespread criticism of the supposed atmosphere of censoriousness on liberal campuses, where in fear of unfair accusation, lack of fair process from administrators, and the lurking possibility of investigation is said to create a general chill on free thinking, inquiry, and expression. It has been highly tempting for liberals to dismiss this dire picture as one that is self-servingly painted by conservatives for political gain, to attack a straw man of liberal progressive campus hegemony. My own experience as a left, liberal, legal, feminist, academic, is that the chill that has descended on the classroom since 2007, when I began teaching, is significant. Left liberal students, including students who are in the vulnerable, gr vulnerable groups that discrimination policies are supposed to protect, tell me that they don't generally try to speak their views among their peers. They tell me that they don't dare to engage in genuine exchanges or explorations of ideas in class. And I feel their fear, their fear of each other, while leading discussions in criminal law and in constitutional law and family law. Left liberal academic colleagues at various institutions tell me that they feel at constant risk of self-immolation in the classroom and have therefore greatly curtailed the issues they are willing to explore. At the very same time that Me Too and Black Lives Matter have created wonderful openings, opportunities, and demand for deepening and strengthening teaching about gender and race, many teachers tell me that they avoid class discussions of topics that touch on gender, race, or anything controversial for fear that they will misstep, cause pain, cause a scandal, or get reported to the school authorities. What a missed opportunity. And many of those who do persist in teaching on controversial topics are already vulnerable professors of color, who, as it turns out, may feel more risk of allegations of wrongdoing in comparison to white male peers who avoid such risky discussions. What's more, professors and students also report that they don't want to express even these kinds of concerns about the academic environment out loud because their peers might take them to mean that they are insufficiently committed to anti-discrimination goals. These constraints on academic freedom are largely ones that people within universities have imposed on ourselves through our fearful silences or our failures to properly calibrate and balance 
our internal university policies and practices to account for their effects on free inquiry and free speech. But the traditional way in which academic freedom has been threatened in the United States over the decades is by the government constraining the activities of schools and teachers. And this year we have seen precisely that once again in the political and legislative movements to ban the teaching of critical race theory in schools. Now I'm going to bracket right now the gap between what is commonly being referred to as CRT and what the actual academic movement of critical race theory actually is. Um, in the public debate, CRT is a floating signifier for ideas that the anti-CRT folks abhor and characterize as racist. I understand this movement as an intense backlash against the increased social influence of the idea of racism as systemic, structural, and institutional as opposed to racism as an individual's idiosyncratic prejudice. Anti-CRT advocates appear to think that they too are fighting discrimination. And Oklahoma law made it unlawful for schools to make part of a course the concept that an individual by virtue of his race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. In response, some colleges have paused courses and teaching about racial inequality. The anti-CRT movement is now a shorthand for the deep cultural, social, and political divisions in this country around race and the legacy of slavery, divisions that harken back to the Civil War. And in that context, one of the biggest academic freedom stories of this year was about Nicole Hannah-Jones, the author of the 1619 Project, the New York Times series exploring the legacy of slavery, who was offered a chair at the University of North Carolina's journalism school, but was denied tenure for the position because of interference from the school's conservative donor. And indeed, the Trump administration had created what it called the 1776 Commission as a response to the 1619 project and issued a report that promoted, quote, patriotic education, unquote, that downplayed slavery and condemned progressive politics. In the name of fighting an alleged orthodoxy, bans on CRT plainly attempt to cast a pall over orthodoxy, a pos, a, cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. Academic freedom in the classroom is the key battleground right now in the so-called culture war. And championing academic freedom and free inquiry by undermining it has become a strategy in that culture war. Each side has accused the other of attempting to indoctrinate students and of being against free thinking. Those who genuinely believe in the value of academic freedom must wrest it away from disingenuous invocations and truly defend it by wrestling with its genuine difficulties, including its genuine clashes with anti-discrimination efforts. Academic freedom, I believe, is essential to the education of citizens for a democracy, and it creates the conditions for the production of knowledge. And academic freedom should be defended by including within it the values of diversity, inclusion, and anti-discrimination, without taking as absolute what any of those values consist of. People tend to think about academic freedom as an individual freedom, the freedom of individual academics or students to express their views and ideas. But academic freedom is an institutional value. It's not just an individual right. Academic freedom is not only a matter of an individual's conscience, it is a public good. And properly understood, it doesn't merely exist to benefit individual professors and students. It enables the process of exploration that benefits society and humankind. But the idea that universities themselves can be trusted to guard academic freedom is wrongheaded. It will often seem better for the school in the short term to eliminate a professor or a student who is drawing negative press or angering students or parents or donors than to protect the long term ideal of academic freedom, particularly when fighting discrimination appears to be on the other side of the ledger. Universities and colleges participate in knowledge, producing knowledge and teaching it in areas of inquiry that are unsettled. And that frontier of unsettled inquiry is a territory in which definitions of academic freedom must be constantly and rationally 
renegotiated in response to, to changing social values that are evolving our institutions over time. And in our time, the value of academic freedom is being renegotiated specifically in relation to the changing meanings of discrimination. And as we engage in this negotiation today, we have to acknowledge that there has been a shift in how the new generation of students coming of age at a time of social upheaval are oriented differently than people of say my generation to free speech in general and academic speech in particular. We need to take seriously the claim that some exercises of academic freedom may ratify the infliction of harm on vulnerable people. Today's students are just more likely than students of my generation to recoil at a content neutral defense of free speech, perhaps because they are coming of age at a time when white supremacists march openly and become violent. And so I can understand why one might recoil at the notion of an entirely content neutral defense of academic freedom. In this era, we have to be sober. We have to not be in denial about the ways in which anti-discrimination principles as they are developing and academic freedom principles may come into conflict. And at that time, we should not give up on either set of principles because they are both essential to the mission of the university. The negotiation of this tense balance, and it really is a negotiation, it is difficult, it's complicated, and most of all, it requires attention to context and nuance, compassion, and non-absolutism. It requires tools that we have to teach each other and our students. It is not something we must simply defend in a war so much as a practice that we must live. And it is a daily struggle within both universities and within ourselves. I am very excited for the comments that are going to follow from Professor Bridges and Professor Whittington and for the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Gerson. Um, so much to, to think about and respond to there. And to begin that process, uh, we're going to move to our first uh, commentator, uh, Professor Bridges. Thank you so much um, for uh, this event. Um, I am honored to be a part of it. And thank you, Professor Gerson, for um, providing us with such a generative um, prompt. Um, it's such a timely issue. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to, to begin the colloquy. But first, I'll sort of give my perspective on the issue. Um, in the essay on which my comments are based, um, I first examine the pressures on academic freedom that are coming from the left uh, before turning to a separate examination of pressures that are coming from the right. Um, I ultimately offered that not only are these pressures different in kind, but they are also different in degree. And I conclude that because the threats to academic freedom from the left and the right are so dissimilar, um, they deserve dissimilar responses. Um, but today, I would I only have 15 minutes, so I would like to focus my time um, on the threat to academic freedom that is coming from the right. And so I would like to share my screen. Um, I just recently started using PowerPoint um, for presentations once we went online to Zoom for everything, and now I can't stop. So I have <laughs> slides for everything. Um, so um, the Republican Party um, has launched a war on what it has called critical race theory. Um, and we might trace the beginning of this war to September 2020. Um, when conservative activist uh, Christopher Ruffo appeared on Tucker Carlson's popular Fox News show to lament um, the federal government's practice of teaching critical race theory to its employees and training. Now, while it is doubtful that the federal government has ever um, trained its employees in actual critical race theory, um, that is, while it is doubtful that the federal government has ever introduced its employees to the analytical uh, tool set and body of scholarship that investigates the law's role in producing and reproducing racial stratification, um, Rufo's call to arms resonated with the Trump administration. Um, shortly after Rufo's appearance on Fox News, um, the administration issued an, a memorandum that instructed federal agencies to, quote, begin to identify all contracts or other agency spending related to any training on critical race theory. 
Trump ultimately issued an executive order that prohibited trainings founded, uh, funded with federal uh, monies that are, quote, rooted in the pernicious and false belief that America is an irredeemably racist and sexist country. As the war against critical race theory gathered steam, conservative activists, commentators, and politicians broadened their focus beyond federal agencies and turned their attention to K through 12 schools, sites that they identified as sort of hotbeds of instruction in critical race theory. After Biden defeated Trump in the 2020 presidential election, Republican lawmakers thereafter turned their attention to the states introducing and in many cases successfully passing legislation that purports to ban CRT in government and schools. The descriptions of critical race theory from its conservative opponents make obvious that the target of their crusade is not in fact the body of scholarship that legal um, academics first began developing in the 1980s. This is a body of scholarship that I described at length in my 2018 primer on the subject. I wrote the book before the hullabaloo. Um, and it is important to bear in mind that these misdescriptions are no accident. As Rufo himself tweeted, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. So if critical race theory has become a term that references not a distinct legal literature, but rather a brand category that it is intended to capture everything that is unpopular with Americans, it raises the question of what efforts to ban it are in fact banning. A closer investigation reveals that these bans endeavor to prohibit ideas like structural racism, for example, that challenge the notion that the country's dreadful racial past is indeed a thing of the past. These bans target any concept like white privilege, for example, that proposes that race helps to explain why some people live lives that are longer and more comfortable than others. As theorist David Theo Goldberg describes it, for the political right, critical race theory means any talk of race and racism at all, a catch-all specter. Indeed, any suggestion that racial inequities in the United States are anything but fair outcomes, the result of choices made by equally positioned individuals in a free society. In this way, we see how the crusade against critical race theory is part of an ideological war that endeavors to construct the US as post-racial, a nation that has put racism firmly in the rear view mirror. The stakes of the war are incredibly high because if the nation is post-racial, then any racial reckoning that the nation has begun to have is misguided. Moreover, the actors that have been calling for this racial reckoning, organizers, protesters, activists, students, scholars, then these folks are delusional, wrong, dangerous. If the nation is post-racial, then people who insist upon talking and thinking about race are the real racists. If the nation is post-racial, then we do the right thing when we silence them, our portrayal of our nation as one that values free speech notwithstanding. The status of critical race theory as a stand-in for any talk about race that is nothing less than triumphant and complacent about the racial state of the union likely means that these bans, if upheld, will simply censor any and all talk about racism, racial inequality, and racial injustice. It is worth noting that even if the critical race theory bans that legislatures have passed actually endeavored to ban critical race theory properly conceptualized as the academic framework that investigates the law's role in protecting and legitimating the nation's racial hierarchy, the scholarship and ideas that the bans prohibit would still be unclear 
with the bans prohibit exposure to any and all arguments that critical race theorists have ever made. For example, would they ban critiques of discriminatory intent as opposed to disparate impacts as the test for when strict scrutiny ought to be used to review racially burdensome laws under the 14th Amendment? Does it matter that people who are not critical race theorists have also critiqued the discriminatory intent test? Would they ban any discussion of intersectionality since the term has been useful to many critical race theorists and it was coined by the same person who gave critical race theory its name, that person is Kimberly Crenshaw. Does it matter that the concept of intersectionality also has been useful to people who are not critical race theorists? Does it matter that some people whom proponents of these bans would likely identify as critical race theorists have critiqued the concept of intersectionality? Would the bans prohibit explorations of implicit bias research, explorations in which many critical theorists have engaged? Would they also prohibit critiques of implicit bias research, critiques that many critical race theorists have authored, myself included? The uncertainty around what bans of a rigorously defined critical race theory would prohibit is simply due to critical race theory status as a framework. CRT is an approach to viewing law and society. Scholars investigating the same questions can deploy the framework and arrive at different answers. In the essay on which my remarks are based, I propose that academic freedom will suffer if anti-discrimination laws are deployed to compel institutions to ensure that students feel good in the classroom. But perhaps more importantly, the quality of the education offered in our classrooms will suffer as well. Part of the mandate of, the in of institutions of higher learning has been to expose students to new ideas and in so doing to challenge them. Part of the mandate of law schools in particular is to train students to see all sides of an argument, especially the sides that do not initially occur to the student because they misalign with the student's ethical and political commitments. If professors must ensure that classrooms are spaces in which students can expect to be free from discomfort, critique, or opposition, then colleges and universities will have failed to accomplish their mission. The graduates of these institutions will be the worst for it. And if these institutions serve a public function of producing actors who can engage with all manner of concepts and ideas, then society ultimately will suffer. So I strongly believe that everything suffers, including academic freedom, if anti-discrimination laws are deployed to compel institutions to ensure that students feel good in the classroom. It deserves emphasizing then that this is exactly how some conservatives would deploy anti-discrimination laws vis-a-vis -vis speech concerning racism, racial inequality, and racial injustice. Austin Newsom, who is the Montana Attorney General, issued a binding opinion holding that, quote, the use of critical race theory and anti-racism programming discriminates on the basis of race, color, or national origin in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Article II, Section 4 of the Montana Constitution, and the Montana Human Rights Act. In his opinion, Newsom argues that a school that, quote, permits, promotes, or endorses curricula or pedagogical methods that tell an individual that he or she should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any form of psychological distress on account of his or her race almost certainly uh, creates a right racially hostile environment and thereby violates federal and state anti-discrimination laws. Now, it is unclear which curricula or pedagogical methods tell an individual that they should feel any of the psychological and emotional states listed in the opinion. However, what is clear is that Knudsen is desperately concerned about lessons and classroom discussions that make presumably white students feel bad about their race. Moreover, Knudsen is committed to using existing laws to protect white students from these unhappy feelings. 
Further, many bands that were inspired by the attacks on critical race theory endeavored to prohibit the teaching of divisive concepts. And of course, the question becomes, what exactly is a divisive concept? Is gender inclusive language a divisive concert, concept? Is using they, them, theirs pronouns or referring to pregnant people as opposed to pregnant women, is that divisive? What about ranked choice voting? Is that a divisive concept? And as much as the US doesn't do it, it's trickle down very divisive. Is that a divisive concept? Right, the uncertainty in what constitutes a divisive concept means that such bans, if upheld, will chill all manner of speech. And the mortal threat that these laws pose to academic freedom should be obvious. I end today by asking, what is the best way to respond to these pressures or of, on academic freedom generated from the right? As I mentioned, I think that the pressures generated from the left are dissimilar from those generated from the right, and so they deserve dissimilar responses. So the question I focus on right now is how should we respond to the questions, um, the pressures generated from the right? It just seems to me that the right might need to remind itself of the claims that it made in the 1990s when self-identified critical race theorists argued that the First Amendment should not be uh, interpreted to protect racist hate speech. During that historical moment, many conservatives and liberals rejected these theorists' claims, arguing that the First Amendment was incompatible with protections against injurious speech. They contended that the best response to harmful speech was not to limit speech, but rather to ensure that everyone could speak. In the 1990s, conservatives wanted more speech. In the 2020s, they want less. If conservative pundits, activists, and scholars really value the First Amendment as much as they claimed just three decades ago, then they should recognize that bans on critical race theory, divisive concepts, and the like as the wildly un-American efforts that they are. And I will end there, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Professor Bridges. And now we will hear from Professor Whittington. Before we continue, a special thanks to our sponsor, Vincent and Elkins, a global law firm with 11 offices and more than 700 lawyers committed to excellence in serving and advising its sophisticated clients in industries such as energy, finance, technology, real estate, media, and beyond. v &E lawyers are also proud to support pro bono clients across their communities. To help clients navigate complex areas of law, v &E hires the best and brightest law students and lawyers, valuing diverse perspectives and backgrounds. Visit www.velaw.com to learn more about v &E's summer associate program and hiring opportunities. Start your success story at Vincent and Elkins. So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to um, speak to you all in part of this uh, really interesting symposium and uh, unfortunately all too timely uh, symposium topic. Um, as uh, both my predecessors noted um, already, um, academic freedom is under a great deal of stress um, uh, these days. And unfortunately, um, it's under a great deal of stress uh, from a lot of different sides and across a whole uh, wide um, array of circumstances. Um, it's going to be a real challenge to sustain robust ideas about academic freedom uh, into uh, the future and having these kinds of conversations um, to identify uh, some of those challenges and to think through uh, why we ought to value um, academic freedom even today and how we might protect it um, most securely uh, into the future um, is going to be uh, quite um, essential. Um, in the brief remarks I have just to sort of get us going as part of this um, conversation, um, I want to emphasize that academic freedom, um, as it's mostly been developed within American uh, universities, um, has a primarily instrumental utility uh, for particular kinds of institutional functions. Um, it has some association with the First Amendment. It certainly mirrors some of the same kinds of concerns. Uh, we have in a larger First Amendment and free speech um, context, um, but academic freedom really lives within the specific institutional environment of universities and how they operate, and they serve a particular function of making those kinds of institutions operate better. Um, one of the challenges of that is the First Amendment doctrine can be sometimes awkward as it might be applied uh, to thinking about specific kinds of academic freedom uh, situations, but it also means if we start reconceptualizing what the very purpose of higher education is, what it is we're trying to get out of universities, what we want them to accomplish, 
it has dramatic implications for academic freedom and the proper scope of academic freedom uh, moving forward. And some of what we struggled over over the last several decades, and certainly part of what we're struggling over right now, is precisely that question. What is it universities are for? What is it we want them to accomplish? And as a consequence, how should we organize these kinds of institutions? And what kinds of, of power and authority and discretion should we lay in the hands of the faculty who are part of those kinds of institutions? So ultimately, this question of how useful academic freedom is depends on this question of what the overarching mission of the institution itself is. Why do we care about universities? And answering that question helps tells us uh, whether or not we also ought to care um, about academic freedom, and if so, in what form that academic freedom um, ought to take. Strikingly, this is a somewhat relatively recent innovation within um, American uh, society in the way the Americans think about their uh, institutions of higher education and think about academic freedom uh, in particular. Um, this view of the university that now largely predominates and went hand in hand with the rise of ideas about academic freedom, but only came about in the late 19th century and early uh, 20th and in the early 20th century. It's always been somewhat idealistic and aspirational. Those ideas about what the university is all about and what the implications are for academic freedom have been contested throughout that period. They have jostled up against other ideas about what it is universities ought to be accomplishing um, and other ideas about the scope, proper scope of academic freedom. They, of course, also are challenged by the simple reality. It's one thing to have ideas about what you hope institutions would do. It's one thing to have ideals and values associated with academic freedom. It's quite another thing to live up to those values in a consistent and principled way. And we face both those kinds of challenges, the challenges of actually living up to our ideals and the challenge of actually thinking through what our ideals actually are. But crucially, in the late 19th century, there was a shift toward thinking of the goal of American universities as being primarily about advancing and disseminating knowledge. That universities ought to be operating on the very frontiers of what it is we think we know, ought to be designed to try to press those frontiers outward, to try to allow us to discover new ideas, new truths about the way society works, the way the world works, the nature of human beings, and to try to preserve and disseminate and communicate those ideas and understandings as best we can. It's worth emphasizing that that was not always the vision of what it was American universities um, ought to do. Um, the old guard in the years, um, even immediately after the Civil War, um, uh, had a very different idea about what kinds of institutions they were taking care of and what kinds of institutions uh, they wanted to continue um, into the future. Um, so the president of Amherst uh, College, for example, um, told his students and his alumni um, that the whole purpose of university education was to nurture a certain kind of reverence for the aged uh, and a veneration for sacred institutions. The president of Harvard University warned uh, the intellectual powers uh, need to be carefully watched and guarded um, so as to prevent um, against um, false excitements, as he characterized it, that might uh, grab the students um, and the faculty uh, on a university campus. From the perspective of those university presidents, um, excessive intellectual activity uh, was a problem that needed to be tamped down on university campuses. University campuses needed to be much more restricted spaces that only allowed certain kinds of questions to be asked and only allowed certain kinds of answers um, to be offered in response to those uh, questions. A new generation of education reformers challenged that notion and tried to open universities up, open universities up to being willing to explore a much wider array of ideas, to redirect how universities related um, to their uh, larger sense of what purposes uh, they were serving, and ultimately with implications for who ought to be part of the university uh, environment, who ought to be part of the campus community to engage in this larger um, common project. The initial moves for this reconceptualization of American universities um, often occurred with public universities that were being formed uh, not on the East Coast, but in the Midwest and the Western part of the United States, and then gravitated back to the East Coast and, re and the reformation of private institutions, whether the creation of new private institutions in the late 19th and early 20th century, or the, reform or the reformation of old institutions, institutions like Harvard University or Princeton University that reconceptualized what it was they were all about and what they ought to be doing uh, moving forward with implications then for what the scope of academic freedom ought to be uh, within those kinds um, of institutions. One of those educational reformers of the late 19th and early 20th century was James Engel, the president of the University of Michigan. As he argued in taking over that role, 
Um, the university cannot do its work with the highest success unless it have a certain degree of independence and self-control. It is therefore a right to expect that this privilege will be conceded to it. Written law or the unwritten law of common consent should shield it from the sudden outburst of partisan passions and from the assaults of designing men. The general nature and details of its work should be determined by those charged with the immediate responsibility of administering its affairs. No undue restraints should be laid upon the intellectual freedom of the teachers. No man worthy to hold a chair here will work in fetters. In choosing members of the faculty, the greatest care should be taken to secure gifted, earnest, reverent men whose mental and moral qualities fit them to prepare their pupils for manly and womanly work and promoting our Christian civilization, but never insist on their pronouncing the shibboleths of sect or party. So only can we train a generation of students to Catholic, candid, truth-loving habits of mind and tempers of heart. The challenge for university presidents like Engel was how to persuade the general public and how to persuade powerful politicians, in particular in instances of these state institutions like the University of Michigan, to grant universities a certain kind of independence, to encourage politicians and the general public to tolerate universities that were willing to explore new ideas, that were willing to challenge conventional wisdom, that were willing sometimes to offend the ideas and values of the general public, of influential donors, of the alumni, and of politicians um, themselves. Part of that sales job that these university presidents needed to make uh, was precisely um, that we would be better off as a society if we were willing to give universities that kind of independence. That even though people might well be uncomfortable with the kinds of ideas that are being explored or articulated on university campuses, that in the long run, American society would improve. In the long run, American society would be better off if we allowed those ideas to circulate, to percolate, to be tested, to be challenged, and to be developed, because ultimately society was better off if we could rely on the truth rather than simply be convinced to continue to adhere uh, to our dogma. But part of what was important about that was an argument that said we had that universities had to be open-minded about what kinds of arguments were going to be put in place. University presidents had to persuade the general public and persuade donors that these institutions would not be partisan institutions. They would stand above partisanship. They would not be committed to particular kinds of interest in societies. They would not be captured by particular uh, sects, whether religious sects or political sects or others uh, within society. Um, but instead, we'd be developing a group of scholars who were independent-minded, who were willing to explore ideas as best they could and take that to wherever um, they think uh, those arguments uh, might lead. That these universities be open to anyone to come onto the university campus. They wouldn't shut their doors to some ideas. They should, wouldn't shut their doors to some kind of people. Um, but in the uh, words of the University of California president of the period, um, they would be a home of a kind of intellectual democracy in which people would not be judged by blood or birth or influence, but instead they'd be united in ideal loyalty to real truth. And ultimately the public would be better off if they could create institutions that had that kind of commitment and preserve them into the future. But of course, that's a challenging uh, uh, thing to try to create. It's challenging to create those kinds of institutions. It's challenging to preserve those institutions uh, into the future. Academic freedom was a part of the set of policies and practices uh, certainly not all that's necessary in order to help sustain those kinds of institutions. Academic freedom is designed to protect the research and teaching freedom of faculty to explore controversial and difficult ideas in their research and teaching without undue intervention by university administrators or by donors or alumni or politicians or others um, outside the university, but also others outside the expertise of the particular faculty um, who are trying to um, grapple uh, with those uh, difficult and controversial ideas um, on their own. Academics needed the freedom to make mistakes. They needed the freedom to test and question uh, what was conventional wisdom, what was popular morality, what were commonly held ideas. And moreover, they needed the freedom ultimately to be able to communicate what they think they know to the broader public, which means in part, they need the freedom to be able to participate in the public sphere, to reveal to the public, as well as to their colleagues and to their students, what they think they understand. 
about the nature of the world and the nature of society uh, more generally, even when people might be offended or disturbed or threatened by the kinds of ideas that the academics um, were bringing to bear. But notably, academic freedom only provides limited protection for this purpose. It's an essential protection. It's critical that university faculty uh, not be threatened with sanction or discipline because they teach something that's controversial, because they're researching controversial ideas, because they say something that might be controversial in the public sphere. But academic freedom is only designed to protect people um, against official, official sanction um, by uh, their university employers. Um, they can't be fired. Uh, given sufficient academic freedom protections for voicing unpopular ideas. But that doesn't protect them from being shunned uh, for expressing those ideas. It doesn't uh, protect them from being criticized for those ideas. Um, it doesn't protect them from being reviled for offering um, those ideas. Um, unfortunately, those things too can limit the ability and willingness of scholars to ask difficult questions and actually pursue lines of inquiry um, to what uh, actually might be the right answers at the end of the day. Academic freedom uh, gives us somewhat partial protection and partial security in order to try to realize this goal of the university, uh, but academic freedom by itself uh, will not be adequate. But as I said, this vision of what universities are trying to accomplish, why we ought to value universities in the first place, and as a consequence, why we ought to value academic freedom has always been contested and challenged. It's contested and challenged now just as it was in the earlier decades of American history. There are alternative views about what it is universities um, ought to accomplish. And so, for example, while these educational reformers argued that democracy would be better off and would be um, ultimately improved, and it was in the public interest to explore ideas because democracy would benefit, the larger public interest would benefit from knowing the truth about things. Um, and that sometimes meant challenging a particular interest, entrenched interest, um, in uh, the status quo. But of course, an alternative vision of what those universities ought to accomplish is we might view them as extensions of the government itself, extensions of what the current political majority or current government officials might want to accomplish, what's in their interest, what's consistent with their sets of particular values, what's consistent with their particular policies. And if that's what universities are supposed to be accomplishing, then of course the range of inquiry that's tolerable on those institutions is much more limited. It was a challenge for those educational reformers in the late 19th century to try to persuade politicians that it's okay if people on university campuses sometimes challenge the policies and interests and values of the politicians themselves, but we're seeing the same thing uh, today. So recently, for example, the University of Florida tried to prohibit a set of faculty from providing expert testimony um, in lawsuits being filed against this current state government. In the words of the, state, of the University of Florida officials, um, it was a conflict of interest and not in the best interest of the University of Florida for the faculty at the University of Florida to be involved in a lawsuit against the state itself. There is a vision of identity of interest between the current incumbent government officials uh, and the University of Florida. And as a consequence, scholars ought to be limited in what they can do so as not to conflict with uh, the particular interest of incumbent government officials. This is a radically different vision of what it is the um, American universities ought to accomplish, certainly a different vision of what state universities ought to accomplish um, than how state universities are being sold to the public when they were first being established in the late 19th and early 20th century. But there's always been those people around who think that that's what we ought to be doing. And the implications of that kind of vision, that thinking about universities as handmaidens of the current government, is precisely to limit and shrink the sphere of intellectual inquiry that can take place on those campuses, and ultimately also to cut off the ability of scholars to ultimately reach toward um, the truth um, at the end of the day. But unfortunately, government officials are not the only ones who are interested in trying to cabin and limit the scope of freedom of inquiry on college campuses. Students often are not very happy to be confronted with ideas that they themselves uh, find offensive and disturbing on college campuses. And it's long been a struggle um, to uh, protect faculty from the outrage of students and by extension, often their parents and alumni and donors and politicians and other members of the community um, who find uh, university faculty uh, teaching or researching or speaking out um, in ways that students find discomforting um, or offensive or even uh, dangerous. 
Um, universities um, have tried to resist that instinct on the part of students to try to convince students um, of what it is they're accomplishing on a university campus that extends sometimes to encountering ideas that they might find uh, discomforting. Um, but just like it's difficult to persuade politicians that they ought to tolerate universities that explore offensive and disturbing ideas, it's likewise sometimes difficult to persuade students um, that universities are best off, and they even as students are best off, um, to have to encounter and grapple with um, ideas that they might find uh, discomforting in various ways. There's also a temptation, unfortunately, on university campuses themselves, um, but also from individuals off campuses um, to try to reorient universities um, and place them on the footing of having a set of thick shared values um, that will cabin and limit the scope of, of intellectual inquiry that can reasonably man be managed on those college campuses. Classically, we've seen this in uh, religious institutions in the United States where some religiously connected um, uh, colleges and universities um, have required statements of belief and affirmations to particular kinds of principles before people can join that particular campus community. It's understood in those circumstances that the scope of intellectual inquiry that occur, can occur on those campuses is ultimately delimited. So there are real bounds that are um, identified by those statements of belief. There are dogmas that should not be questioned um, on those campuses. What is striking is the extent to which um, that similar sensibility um, has increasingly creeped into secular institutions um, as well. And of course, the dogmas um, they're being enforced on those campuses uh, are not the same religious dogmas um, that occupy some religiously affiliated institutions, um, but rather political and social dogmas, a belief that there are certain values that have to be shared um, by everyone on this campus, that there are certain values um, to which everyone needs to be committed, and ultimately certain values that cannot be uh, questioned, interrogated, or challenged on a university campus. This too uh, strikes at the very heart of what we thought universities were all about, which is to say the universities were operating under the assumption that there were no values, no ideas that were off the table. Everything could be questioned and challenged. And ultimately we'd be better off if we could hear those challenges, work them through and try to provide responses um, to them. Today, we're in a very difficult situation in which uh, people on both the left and the right are increasingly uncomfortable uh, with this idea that universities ought to have that kind of freedom, that scholars on university campuses ought to have that freedom to explore a um, uh, full range of ideas and uh, follow arguments wherever they might lead. Of course, those on the left and right have different ideas about which kinds of ideas might be uh, needing to be protected uh, from academic inquiry. Um, on those college campuses. They have different tools that they can use uh, to try to shrink the space of intellectual inquiry um, on college campuses. But if universities are going to serve the public function, if they're going to serve the public good in the way that we thought they were uh, when we first were establishing them and transforming them into the kinds of institutions they are um, today, uh, then we need to try to adhere to that core mission that core mission of having institutions be places uh, where we're trying to advance the boundaries of human knowledge, which means asking difficult questions. It means raising controversial ideas and sometimes coming up with answers that not everyone's going to be happy with. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Emphasis Added is a podcast by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you heard, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and follow the Houston Law Review on social media or check us out on HoustonLawReview.org. Till next time.